You are listening to Accents, a radio show for literature, art, and culture. I'm your host, Katerina Stoikova, and my guest today is writer, poet, teacher, historian, Dr. Richard Taylor. Hi, Richard. Welcome to the show. Hi, Katerina. Delighted to be here. Dr. Richard Taylor uh, lives in Kentucky and often, very often, writes about Kentucky. He is the author of several books of poetry and essays. Most recently, his novel, Gertie, is being republished by the University Press of Kentucky. And we'll start the conversation there. Tell us about this book. Tell us the story of the book. This book was originally published in 1977 by Turtle Island Foundation, a private press in San Francisco, California. And it was, uh, I was delighted to have it published there. And it was published in large part because my dissertation director, Guy Davenport, the great Guy Davenport, uh, knew the publisher, Bob Callahan, and he said, you ought to take a look at this and I think rather than say no, Bob Callahan consented to publish it. That publication went out of print after a couple of years. It was letterpress printing. So there weren't, I don't know how many copies were made, but probably fewer than a thousand. After that, it went to uh, Noman Press which is, as you know, located here in Frankfurt. That's Jonathan Green's press. He did a beautiful edition of it. It too went out of print after a few years. And the late Charlie Hughes of Wynn Publications published it. Charlie, as you know, is no longer with us. And uh, so a year or two ago, I, I thought, well, this is one book I, I, I'd really like to see back in print. And I uh, wrote the University, uh, University Press of Kentucky, and they very kindly uh, consented to reprint it. And uh, I'll show you a, an image of the cover here. Lovely. And, uh, I can tell you it just came out. It, it's been out less than a month. And there, there was a hardbound edition as well as a paperbound edition. I hope that will be available in your local bookstores. If you can't find it there, it's, I'm sure it's available online as well as my, fa my favorite bookstore, which is Poor Richards in Frankfort, Kentucky. At any rate, this book has had a number of incarnations and I'm hoping the university press will keep it in print for a while. But it was written first, it was published first in 1977, uh, a long time ago. So, well, first of all, did you change anything from reprint to reprint to reprint? Uh, only in very minor ways. I think I added uh, a speech that Simon Gurdy had made to, uh, to his Indian allies. I suppose I should tell you something about yeah, who Simon Yeah, please, tell us about was. Simon Gurdy. Simon Gurdy lived from 1741 to 1818. He was born, he was the son of an Irish immigrant, and he was born on, in the western part of Pennsylvania, on the frontier, uh, when he was quite young, I think maybe 10 years of age, his father was killed in a brawl of some kind, and uh, his mother remarried, and in 1756, uh, Simon and two of his three brothers were captured by Indians. Uh, and for several years, he lived among the Indians and he learned eventually 
two or three Indian languages. When the revolution came along, the American Revolution, he was working for uh, at Fort Pitt for the revolutionary cause. And for some reason that's not entirely clear, it may have involved money or a failure to get a promotion. He defected to the British and Indians and which gave rise to the idea of Simon Gurdy as the great renegade. He was perhaps the most hated man in America up to, I would guess, John Wilkes Booth, the, the, the assassin of, of President Lincoln. Uh, he was seen as a person who betrayed his race. And from the time of his defection, he lived among the Indians, sometimes as a trader, and sometimes as a scout, and sometimes as a military advisor for the British. He was in and out of Kentucky, and most famously at the siege of Bryan Station in 1782. And the siege of Bryan Station called together, gosh, I think several active militias in the state, including one uh, from Lexington, including also Daniel Boone. At that time, there were three counties in Kentucky, and all of them sent troops to, uh, to relieve the siege at Bryan Station. Actually, the siege was a kind of decoy, and the British, the force of British and Indians and Simon Gurdy left a clear trail of what is now highway, US Highway 68. And this party pursued, and when they reached uh, what is now Blue Licks State Park, uh, the British and Indians had laid a trap and uh, Boone and others, Boone was very leery of, of pursuing, crossing the river to pursue any farther, but some hotheads in the group uh, which consisted of about 180 men, crossed the creek, fell into an ambush. And at that time, oh, Kentucky lost a number of its early leaders, including members of the Todd family who were the founders of Lexington. Uh, Daniel Boone himself lost his son, Israel. Uh, in total, I think about 70 uh, uh, settlers or frontiersmen were killed in that battle. The British went back across the Ohio River to the safety of the Indian villages that were there. That battle is regarded as the most disastrous defeat of Kentuckians uh, in, in that, at that time, and I guess until now, in its history. Uh, Gurdy then for the next 30 or 40 years was active in the resistance of native peoples to the settlement of what is the old Northwest Territory, Ohio, Indiana, and up into the Great Lakes region. He eventually, in 1784, when he was in his early 40s, he married for the first time a young woman who was a captive of the Indians and started his own family. And at the time of his death, he was living in, in Ontario at a place called Amherstburg. And oddly, perhaps not so oddly, in Canada, he is regarded as a, a kind of national hero uh, for his contributions, not only to the British, 
but in the resistance of the First Nations to the settlement of the Ohio River Valley. Uh, I've got to tell you a story about, about, about this. When, uh, uh, some years back, someone gave me a book called Outlaws, Famous Outlaws of Canada. And in it, of course, there was a chapter on Simon Gody. In fact, there was an image which purported to be a small painting of Gody, the only painting that uh, pretended to be done during his life. So I wrote the publisher. I wanted to use it when the Nomon book came out. I wrote the publisher and I didn't hear anything for several months. And finally, I received a letter from an individual, I kid me not, named Dwight Gertie. And Dwight Gertie was one of the descendants of Simon and he said, sure, go ahead and use the image. And he sent me a very nice photograph of the image that had been handed down in his family. Uh, that image is not in the, in, in the current book, but it's, uh, and I, let me talk a little bit about, about the book. And uh, I saw it as a kind of experimental novel. It was a pastiche. That is, it was made up of a number of different genres. First, there was a kind of narrative, some of which was made up, but, but the scenes in it were made up, but uh, the facts were essentially the facts of, of Gertie's life as I had uh, researched him. Uh, there were also poems. I tried to follow the idea that, you know, we live our lives uh, from heartbeat to heartbeat. There's a continuity. And we remember the lives of others through episodes. And so there wasn't a straightforward plot line in this novel, though it was relatively chronological. And so I included both historical records, uh, a historical narrative written third person, a first person, first person episodes in at key moments in uh, Gertie's life, and then poems to be used as kind of punctuation in that life. And so what I thought I might do is give you just uh, a little sample. And I'm going to start with two or three. The poems were very short. And uh, this is probably the most experimental book I'd, I'd written. And I had a lot of fun doing it. There are portions of it which are uh, gosh, transcriptions of historical accounts of various events, including the rather macabre uh, burning at the stake of an individual named Dr. William Crawford. Uh, but then there are, as I mentioned, these, these more imaginative pieces. I'm going to read you uh, a couple, a few of the poems. Gertie was an illiterate, I should tell you. Uh, he was obviously a very intelligent guy, having mastered these languages and serving for a time as an interpreter. Gertie contemplates the world of letters. I stare at the page, the words like tiny boots, their heels in snow tracks I can't make or follow. Words fur my head, they weave thick weaves and pelt my bones. They shrivel when I stretch. My comfort to know you will know me not by tracks, but only by some skins I've shed. 
Um, I'm going to read a couple more poems just to give you a, a, a sense of how they were used to kind of bridge portions of the narratives. This one is a very short one called November the 1st, 1779, First Snow. A sense of beginnings, the light more intense, found, sound furred in deep shawls, the slopes purified of all detail, the snow made literate with our feet. Um, maybe one or two more here. And then I'm going to read, if, if, with your permission, a, uh, a sample of the, the prose. Um, this poem is simply called The Hard Winter. The Hard Winter of 79, snow rose to our waist before it froze. Rivers locked hands, creeks were crystal stiff with diamond fish. Wind blew so chill, brutes sang in the woods. The maples split and cracked like pistols. Frost bit green cane and rain fell frigid needles. It turned so cold, turkeys tumbled off their roost and broke like China. Cows hugged chimneys till the mucus in their nostrils froze. I lost one toe. Okay, I'm gonna read just a portion of this, uh, this little, what I refer to as a kind of interlude. And there are these moments of awareness on the part of Gertie and they, part of the idea here is to get away from history, which deals largely in facts and abstraction, and to recreate a kind of sensory world of the imagination, one in which Gertie may have uh, passed some of those heartbeats we referred to earlier. This is called the meadow. Shot this morning, a fine red buck, 12 points. Having slept in some beaches, I wake to sounds of a squirrel cutting, his long incisors gnawing small bitter beech nuts somewhere close. Breakfast, cocking and priming, quiet as I can, I settle back in my robes to spy him out. My right hand fixed on leaf ends, leaf ends as the uppermost glow out of the half light and burn white along the edges, trunks still steaming. And wait, a quarter hour later, Brother Squirrel and I both sense some third presence, the feel of some interloper moving over my body like waves. Then the hush. For a moment or two, everything goes stony as we listen. Insects, squirrel, twitter of thrushes, even yesterday's shower mammaling in the branch. Then as evenly starts up again. Some moments pass before I see him. 30 paces off, head bent in the brows, a fat buck grazing his way through the high grass which abounds in the clearing. This clearing, a meadow not much larger than the shade of a sizable tree is to my right. Now, fortunately, upwind. Peculiar the way he moves and chews, methodically and cautious, raising his head now and then to catch my scent, but doesn't. He is so close, I can see the dark, wet dew line on his forelegs. Part of him still vague in the blue film, sunlight is cutting now. The antler tree sprouting out of his crown rolls in time with the working of his jaws. Fickle, he tries one delicacy, then another, gathering salads, his arched neck deftly yanking and twisting the foliage from its roots. 
His winter coat he has not shed yet. It's matted and shaggy, the color of dry bark. Parts of it stucco with flaky mud. I can just make out the ring of dung beneath his tail. Um, he shoots the deer and I move toward him as if under water, my ears still swarming with the shot. That high pitched painting sound that fill, fills my head like a hemorrhage. When I reach him, the tremors are already in his extremities, legs stiffening in off, awkward jerks, large buck eyes glazing. The hooves, fine and sharp as chisels, even sharper now, have that clean take on as they are separated from their functions, lose their grace. Bending closer, I find the knot of blue stem stuck between the front teeth, still dude. Life and death plop in my head, life and death. I see the long jaws chewing and now still, the yellow glint of the cuspids with their chaw of green. My hand, no longer mine, moving by some instinct of its own to my side where my knife is. The same hand pressing the blade to cut out the tongue and liver delicacies. I think I'll, I'll stop there, but uh, I think this will give you a sense of, oh gosh, what the narrative is about and where it goes. And then the historical portion of it is much larger as there are accounts of the settlement of the state and how things in Gody's world uh, begin to change. And uh, so, thank you, Richard. I want to ask a few questions. Um, Shoot. Yeah. So I guess there are many. I'm going to start here. What did? What was it that interested you, Richard Taylor, in the story of Simon Gerty? I mean, you need to be passionate yeah. and interested in order to write a book. Yeah, uh, I think it goes back to the fourth grade in my elementary school, Emmett Field, and we put in a plug for Emmett Field in Louisville, Kentucky, in Crescent Hill. And at that time, there was a requirement that students would read uh, and be taught some Kentucky history. And I can remember we had a reader and of course we read about the frontier and Daniel Boone. And uh, it's then that I learned about Simon Gurdy who was a rough contemporary, roughly a contemporary of Boone's and who was uh, of course not as popular as Boone who had his own early biographer which made him, which lionized him and made him a, a, a national icon. I've written about Boone as a national icon, but then I saw the darker side of the frontier in Simon Gurdy. And Gurdy, uh, so I decided, well, look, he would make as a Kentucky bad boy, the, an interesting, subject to explore. So then I began digging up what sources I could, anything that made reference to him. And I came across a book written in the 1890s by a historian whose name was, Con had an elegant name, Consul Wilshire Butter, Butterfield, I think, Butterfield. And Butterfield purported to be the definitive source on all things Gurdy. And there were probably some inaccuracies and some of the history was a little stiff and maybe not all of the sources had, as I'm guilty of, had been explored. Uh, but that served as a kind of starting point. And I began to get an image of what I would like to include in the book 
including a few historical records, straight, you know, accounts of Gertie's world and Gertie himself. The fact is, we don't have a single word that Gertie spoke. We know, however, that he was active as a translator, I mentioned that, and there was another story, a really interesting story that, that uh, presented a less than black and white world of the frontier. Uh, there were frontiersmen uh, who were every bit as uh, violent and uh, unforgiving as Gertie was purported to have been. And part of my role here was to try to humanize Gertie. You know, none of us is all good or all bad. We all carry elements, I suppose, of demons and the devil in us. And Gertie certainly had his share, but he also was an individual who contributed uh, to saving the lives of captives, for instance, including, of all people, Simon Kenton. Uh, Simon Kenton was another frontier icon who was with a party attempting to steal horses from the Indians, and he was captured and condemned to be burned at the stake, which was, I suppose, the typical means of execution. And Gertie intervened in his behalf and saved his life. And uh, he saved his life because they had served for, together for a time and that they had become, as he put it, in the wilderness uh, with just God and themselves, a kind of, he felt a kind of bond with Kenton. So Kenton's life was spared, and he would have been a defender of Gertie. Um, I think I got a little off track there, but uh, so, so Gertie was, you know, he was a very complex individual, and I wanted to try to portray that. And I can see how that comes across uh, and how that historical figure can keep your interest for so long, to work, uh, so long in order for you to write a book um, mm -hmm. about it. I want to ask, um, did you ever consider having it a pure biography or did your own creativity start yeah. to... Um, yeah, I, I love history and I dabble with history a lot and I've written, I suppose, some stuff that can be regarded as history, but uh, and I enjoy research, but because I was at the time uh, and still am uh, teaching, I had really little time to, to do the kind of research I wanted to, uh, that would have needed to be done. And because Gertie's life First of all, it's pretty long, and his name figures importantly, not just in Kentucky, but in the Northwest Territory. I knew that that would really be an ambitious undertaking. Fortunately, there is, uh, since the book came out, a really good biography by an individual named Philip Hoffman. In fact, um, I'm reading it now. Uh, and he gives a much fuller account than I at my best would have been able to. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for that and wish I had had that biography um, when, when I wrote my own version of, of Gertie. What did Dwight Gertie think about the book? Did you get any feedback from him? Yes, he loved the book. I'm so glad, I'm it. so glad, uh, yeah. In fact, in fact, I've always regretted, I was invited to speak 
at a ceremony honoring Gertie for maybe the hundredth anniversary of his death. Or there was an occasion. In fact, I've been invited to a couple of them. One in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, and apparently he, there are historic markers there uh, commemorating his. Uh, his experience in the revolution. At any rate, I didn't make it to either of those events. And uh, I kind of regret it in a way because especially the one to Canada and where I would have met uh, Dwight Gertie. And, but but from, from the feedback I got from him, he very much uh, liked the book. I'd sent him a copy of it and uh, and I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And, uh, and and maybe that has something to do with the trying to achieve some sort of balance because Gertie was very much vilified and to some degree with, with, uh, with cause, but also perhaps gratuitously uh, for a number of reasons. And uh, it struck me that that you know he had elements of the devil as well as perhaps of angels as well as as I believe all of us do. So the book has some staying power because it you know it has been in print since seventy seven. Um, do you expect a movie? Do you, do you expect that huh. someone will? I, make I, a movie I, out? You know that. Uh, I've never really thought of that, though, uh, and I don't, I, I probably am incapable of writing a screenplay, uh, but I would love to see it as a movie. I think there's a real story there, though, uh, and I would imagine it done in the mode of, say, uh, the film version of James Fenimore Cooper's uh, the Last of the Mohicans, which was done maybe, right. maybe 10 years ago. And that's really one of the most uh, thoroughly presented images of the frontier world that, that I know. And in fact, the person, tell you another story, uh, Ted Franklin Ballou, who wrote the, uh, the introduction to this version in the last version of Gertie uh, is quite an aficionado of uh, the ways of Native Americans, especially the Shawnee. And in fact, he had told me, I, he lives in Murray and I don't see him often, but he had told me that I should see the movie. In fact, he was, he said, I was in it. He, meaning himself, on both sides, both as an as a Native American in, wearing war dress and one of hundreds who were engaged in what was called Braddock's defeat, as well as on the side of the settlers in different portions of the movie. And I've always been tickled by the idea of it. He played that role, and I've seen that film several times, but I've never seen him uh, because there's so many faces, and he would have been, especially as a Native American, done up in perhaps war paint and a special hairdo and top knot and who knows what else. Uh, but Ted is Ted is a real student of the frontier, much more so than I am. And uh, he's written, I'm reading now a book of his on, I've been dipping into it at least, um, on, on the last days of Daniel Boone. And uh, he, he's done a book or two on Daniel Boone. He also wrote a wonderful book. Uh, I think it was published by UK called The Long Hunt which was a scholarly study of the near extinction of the buffalo. And he went through all the records he could find, starting with the earliest references to buffalo in Kentucky 
and he he named, you know, he went to journals and made reference to the diminishing number of buffalo. The last buffalo in Kentucky, according to his study, uh, died in the early 1820s, about the time that Daniel Boone himself died. Uh, I found that really interesting. So we were, we, by that I mean, uh, uh, the Euro Americans who and, and African Americans who settled Kentucky uh, decimated the great herds of buffalo that existed here. And it was only later that they were introduced from Western herd, reintroduced by Western herds into Kentucky now. And I don't know how many buffalo there are in Kentucky, but you know, they are, they are protected and uh, I've seen them on farms. I know they are in some parks as well. Um, so Ted Ballou is, uh, he's a genuine historian. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm trying to be a poet writer uh, with an avid interest in historical context and uh, con especially Kentucky's past. Once in a conversation years ago, you said, you, Katerina, are a poet of being. I am a poet of place. Yeah. Yeah, You're that's, a I, I'd place. forgotten saying that, but I, it's knowing your work and admiring it as I do, I, I, I think that's very much uh, characterizes you. Uh, and I hope uh, says so something about me. I know that that uh, uh, a couple of years ago I wrote a book called Elkhorn, and right. Elkhorn is the creek near my home where I, for the last fifteen or twenty summers, have kayaked and uh, living where I live for in a actually a, a historic house. Uh, I've gathered information for maybe 20 or 30 years, and a couple of years, a few years ago, I decided, well, how about writing about this place, about Elkhorn and the people who first settled Elkhorn? And uh, the University Press, again, very graciously uh, printed that book and uh, I had, I had a lot of fun doing it. Working with notes and stories I gathered for 30 years. And so it was a kind of uh, point of, of completion for me, uh, very satisfying. But I hope others uh, like that book and I've had a few who told me they do. And you have, as far as I know, a new book of, um poems that is about to come out of Larkspur yeah. Press. Yeah, Larkspur is, uh, you know, a long time ago, I decided that I was interested in writing about persons from Kentucky, uh, either in fiction or in poetry. I wrote a, my other novel is about a, another Kentucky bad boy named Marcellus Jerome Clark who was a Confederate guerrilla during the war between the states or the Civil War. And uh, so I was running out of villains who were interesting. And I decided, well, look, who else has been important in this state that, that has a connection with wilderness? And John James Audubon came to mind and I wrote a collection of poems about him. Abraham Lincoln came to mind, and I won't go into the story about how that came about, but uh, I studied Lincoln for a time. And then uh, I thought, well, who is the most colorful, and I would argue this with virtually anyone, the most colorful Kentuckian of at least the first half, well, of, of, of a great portion of the 20th century, pardon me, the 19th century. 
and that would be Cassius Marcellus Clay. So this collection, again, it's a collection of sonnets based roughly on his life, looking at key moments in Cassius Clay's life. You may know that uh, his home is a state historic shrine in Madison, Kentucky. It's called Whitehall. I recommend it to you. Uh, it's a great place to visit. Um, he was a great uh, emancipator of slaves. He emancipated those he inherited from his father. He was a Transylvania graduate who went to Yale University and came under the influence of William Lloyd Garrison, who was perhaps the most prominent abolitionist of his day. And he came back, uh, Clay came back to Kentucky fueled with the idea of ending slavery in Kentucky. And to do that, he put together a newspaper in Lexington. And uh, as you might guess, that newspaper advocating emancipation was unpopular in what at that time was the most, uh, perhaps the most, uh, uh, the greatest uh, number of slaves being held in bondage in Kentucky. And so the press was dismantled and he as a result had to defend himself when he ran for office and he was apparently a he was, I think he was close to six feet and he was a big hulking individual who apparently knew no fear. And he, there were a number of personal attacks on him and he defended himself with his pistols and his legendary uh, bully knife, which he carried with him. He lived to be quite old, dying in the early 1900s. And uh, when he was 84, I believe I've got the number right, he married, uh, he had a family, his wife for various reasons left him. He was, especially when he was minister for Russia, to Russia during the civil war years. And he was living in this big house by himself, and he ended up marrying the 15-year-old daughter of his tenant on the farm, and, and apparently with her permission, and they lived together, I think, fairly contentedly for at least a couple of years, and then she, uh, she left him and remarried someone else. Uh, so he's really an interesting guy. Uh, related to Henry, the great statesman Henry Clay, uh, they were distant cousins, I believe. Um, but what an interesting life. And then I thought, well, would Gray publish it? Gray Zeitz at Larkspur publish it and uh, wrote these sonnets. It was the third collection of sonnets I've done, one on Audubon, one on Lincoln, and the final one on, on Cassius Clay. And uh, Gray what is the name of that book? The uh, name of that book, oh, it's another great story. It's called Bull's Hell. And Bull's, Bull's Hell. Hell. And there is, I have no authority on Madison County, but there is apparently a portion of the Clay property, and it was extensive, uh, at Clay's Ferry on the Kentucky River. And the story is that uh, Clay had a fractious bull that, you know, a prize bull that bred, uh, you know, bred uh, beef on, on his farm. And for some reason, he became outdone with it. And when the bull would not bend to his will, he enraged it and set it up in such a way that 
the bull ran off a cliff into the Kentucky River. It was a bluff, a cliff, and wow. And the story was that his overseer asked him, and this may or may not be true, I made up a little of this. What became of the bull, this prize bull? And Clay reportedly said, oh, it's gone to bull's hell, and I've been there many times myself. Uh, so I love that story. And uh, I thought, well, he had bullish qualities. He was certainly fractious. He had a high sense of honor and selfhood. And he defended himself in a number of personal attacks. So why not bull's hell? Good long luck. Answer to a, long answer to a short question. That's OK. That's OK. It's fascinating. Thank you so much for letting us know and giving us so much of yourself and of your time and uh, telling us so much about your uh, upcoming books. Congratulations again on the republishing of uh, Gurdi and much success with, with all the books. And I'll talk Thank to you soon. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you for what you do in promoting Kentucky writing. Uh, no one does it as persistently and generously as you do. And uh, I wish you well and hope to see you when this COVID thing slows down a little bit. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.